Hi again. So last time we had talked about measures of center and measures of spread. And those are ways of describing a distribution uh, with a number. But now what we're going to talk about is how do you describe a dis distribution with a picture? So visualizations. The options available to you differ depending on whether you have quantitative or qualitative data. And you'll learn a few different options um, for each. And so let's go just get into it and see what those options are. If you have qualitative data, so remember qualitative and categorical are one and the same. So if you have data that are words, descriptions, categories, then you might make either a pie chart or a bar graph. And so a pie chart, many of you are probably familiar with, it looks like a, a pizza pie or a, a dessert pie cut into slices. The slices may not be evenly sized and the, the sizes correspond to essentially the importance or the frequency of that particular category. So the, the more frequent, the larger the slice. A bar graph you may have seen before also, it is typically a vertical type diagram with rectangles. Um, the rectangles usually aren't touching like I have over here on the left side with maybe three groups or categories that I've just labeled A, B, and C. And the heights of those bars correspond to the frequency or relative frequency of those corresponding groups. So the higher the bar, the more frequent that observation um, is in your data set. If you have quantitative data, so numerical data, and then you've got a histogram, which looks like a bar graph. If you look um, on the right-hand side here, you have something that kind of looks like a bar graph, except in this case, the bars are touching. And so that's one way to differentiate between a histogram and a bar graph is that a histogram, the bars should be touching, and in a bar graph, they should not. If you happen to use Excel, Excel does um, separate the bars regardless of whether it's a bar graph or a histogram. You can manipulate it so that they do touch, but um, it's not a great program for visualization. And so that's, that's how it should be. You can also do a box plot, which I've got in the top right here and I have it horizontal. A box plot could be vertical or it could be horizontal. I've got a horizontal one here. And the general framework for a box plot is that it is made with a five number summary <clears throat> where you've got all of your quartiles. And I know we tend to think of quarters as four, but here you've got five because you have the minimum on the far left, the maximum on the far right. And then you've got the first, second, and third quartiles that um, help you frame your box. So the box spans from Q1 to Q3, which is a concept that you recently learned in a video. The distance between Q1 and Q3 is what? So hopefully some of you said IQR or interquartile range, and that's correct. And so <clears throat> that is something that you're able to get from a box plot is the IQR by estimating the distance or the length of that box. That harder or thicker black line that I have inside the box, Q2, is the second quartile, which is the same as the 50th percentile, or the 50th percentile is the value for which half the data is at or below. So that means it is in the middle of the data set, and that's another concept that you came across in a recent video. The concept that represents a value in the middle of the data set or cuts your data set in half is... And hopefully many of you said median. And so the median is that thick line in the middle of that box. It doesn't have to be perfectly in the center. It could be off um, to the left or right, like I've got over here. But that would be your box plot. You could have points that aren't touching these. They're called whiskers or tails, like I have over here. And that observation, which I'm denoting with an asterisk, but it could be a, a solid point, that is known as an outlier. So box plots are really helpful for outlier detection because usually visually they, they look different than, uh, than the box and the whiskers, which reminds me that a box plot is also called a box and whisker plot. So some of you may be familiar with that name. Now you may have noticed that I did skip over one type of visualization called a stem plot. And the stem plot 
is a neat graph, but it's a graph of numbers. So the numbers aren't in any of these visualizations so far that you've seen, but I'm going to scroll way down because I have an example that I've put in here to demonstrate a STEM plot. I've made some fictional data here. And these are hours of cell phone use per week. And you've got data like 25 hours, 20 hours, 10 hours, 8 hours, 8, hours, eight 7, 15, 15, and so forth. And what a stem plot does is it cuts the data and treats the left side as your stems and the values on the right side as your leaves. It is a bit subjective as to where you cut the data. In this example, it's pretty pretty simple. It's, it's right in the middle. But if you happen to have decimals or um, three-digit numbers, then you can play around with where you make the cut. And so... I made the cut right in the middle of the data values here, literally cutting them from two decimal places into one on the left, one on the right. The values on the left make your stems. You do not repeat your stems. And so what I mean by that is I see one, two, three twos, but I just write two once. I see two zeros, I only write zero once. I see one, two, three, four ones, I write one once. I don't see any fours, but I do see a five. And just to maintain um, order, I put a four in there. So you could see my stems span zero, one, two, three, four, and five. But on the right side, the leaves, you do list all of the leaf values, even if they repeat. And so for example, I see 25. And so next to a two, I have one five. I see 20. And I see 21. So next to the two, I also have a zero and a one. So you could see right here that we have zero, one, and five. So that means we have 20, 21, and 25 as values in the data set, which, which is true. With respect to zero, I see leaves of seven and eight, which I've got right here. With respect to one or teens, we have a 10 two 15s and a 17. So I've got a zero, I have two fives for leaves because there were two 15s and one seven for 17. And then as you continue on, you should be able to split your 38 and 51 to put those leaves appropriately. And so this is what I've got over here. This is a stem plot. You know, stem plot's pretty cool because like I said, it's a visual, but it's made of your data. And it helps you actually you know, visualize the, visualize the data. If you were to rotate it 90 degrees with the stems on the bottom, you could see that you've got something that has kind of like a, a bump and then a longer tail on the right-hand side. So if you were to rotate this so that it flips, and you've got the flat part here and you have a bump that goes up and then a longer tail, that would give you an impression of what the distribution looks like. Before we get to looking at the handout, I do want to introduce you to a method that spans from this visualization, which is a way to determine if you have any outliers. And so last class you learned about the IQR or two videos ago, the interquartile range. And there's something called the 1.5 IQR rule. And what that says is you want to find two bounds, Q1 minus 1.5 IQR and Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. So essentially, you're looking at your box plot and the box, and you're stepping 1.5 IQR from the left and 1.5 IQR from the right side of the box. And <clears throat> that's what's happening. Anything further out from those bounds are outliers. And so you wanna get those bounds and see, are there any data points that are beyond that? And if so, those would be outliers. And so let's take a look at, let's apply it here before you look at that other example I just had up. So this is again, the hours of cell phone use per week data set and <clears throat> Finding the IQR, we need the median. So you can see that the median is 17. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 values. And so 
the sixth value of this ordered data set is going to be the median. So when I look at my stem and leaf plot, I've got 7, 8, 10, 15, 15, 17. So 17 is the sixth value in the order data set. So that is our median. And so that cuts the data set in half. So you've got five to the left, five to the right, which means the third observation in each of those halves are the medians or the first and third quartiles. And so we've got seven, eight, 10. So 10 is going to be Q1. And then looking at the top half, you've got 20, 21, 25. And so 25 is the third value, and that's going to be your third quartile. And the difference or distance between them is your IQR, or 25 minus 10 is 15. Now, 1.5 times 15, or 50% more, is going to be 22.5. And when you add and subtract that from, well, subtract from 10, add to 25, you get the bounds of negative 12.5 up to 47.5. So anything smaller than that negative value or bigger than the 47.5 is an outlier. And there's only one value bigger than 47.5, and that is the number 51. And so in this case, we have one outlier and it is a large one, it is 51. And so that's how you make use of the 1.5 IQR rule. <clears throat> I wanna demonstrate once more, and this is another problem corresponding to whether there are differences in the number of cigarettes smoked per week between males and females. Again, fictional data that I, that I made up here, but you can see I've got a column of male counts, a column of female counts, I split them like I did in the first example, and I made side-by-side -side stem and leaf plots. So this is a, a neat um, tool for comparison. And so I've got these stem and leaf plots. I could see that while the means are similar, that the males have a slightly more skewed distribution because they've got more people that smoke larger quantities, you know, like 54, 61, 70 cigarettes. So <clears throat> what we're doing is we are looking for the median of each and you can get the median of the left side and the median of the right side. And what you should get is 32 for the median for males and 28 for the median of females. So go ahead and see if you could confirm that. And then once you have that, let's take a look at the male side and we'll try to figure out if there are any outliers there. <clears throat> you don't have to do it for the female side because the data look really close together. So it doesn't seem like there would be any outliers, but for the male side with more variability, there might be outliers there. Feel free to pause the video and try to do it yourself. I am going to continue on. And so again, I'm just doing it for the male side. We have a median of 32. So that's going to put us right here and cut the data set into six values on the left and one, two, three, four, five values on the right. And let me just check this one, two, three, four, five. Oh, nope, sorry. It's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so there's five on the right and one, two, three, four, five, five on the left. And so you do have five above and five below, just wanted to be sure. So now when I'm looking at the smaller values, I'm going to find the median of those five. So that's going to be the third number. So 10, 15, 27. So four males. I have Q1 is 27 and Q3 is going to be 35, 54, 54. 54 is going to be the third value there in the ordered data set. And so you have 54, which means that our IQR is going to be 54 minus 27, which happens to still be 27. 
<clears throat> now, when we multiply by 1.5, Fifty percent of twenty seven is thirteen point five, so this is going to give us forty point five for our one point five IQR. And now we are going to subtract that <coughs> from Q one. So Q one minus forty point five is going to be twenty seven minus forty point five. So that is. negative 13.5 and Q3 plus 40.5. That's going to be 54 plus 40.5 or 94.5. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> what we're looking for is, are there any values more negative than that bottom one, which there aren't, there aren't any negative numbers. And are there any values greater than 94.5? The largest value on the male side is 70. <clears throat> and so this tells us that there are no outliers. So while we may have thought that there are, according to the 1.5 IQR rule, there are not. So at this point, what I'd like for you to do is pause the video and try to make headway on the problems in this handout, at least the first two, and then feel free to restart the video and, uh, and we'll talk over those and then we'll continue with the rest um, with you trying to complete those. And so again, pause the video and see what you could answer based on the, the graphs and the questions contained in this handout. Okay, so let's see how you did. We are going to go through the problems on here. Again, hopefully you did your best and tried to, to answer them based on your understanding and I hope you did great, but let's check. So for this first one, we have a pie chart here and it says the study investigated taste preferences for various pie flavors. And the first question asks, what is the most preferred pie flavor? So here you're looking for the largest slice the largest one looks like cherry. <clears throat> and so there I give the answer and the justification. So cherry because it looks like the biggest slice. For part B, which two flavors appear to be equally preferred? And so this one's a little subjective, but from my eye, it looks like vanilla cream and blueberry have the same size slice. And so that's more of what I'd be expecting the answers to be and the reason why. If you felt something else, but your justification was right, you know, I'd give credit. <clears throat> and that's it for the first one. For the next problem, here you have a collection of box plots. And so a study was done with guinea pigs and it was looking at um, the effect on tooth growth based on vitamin C levels. And vitamin C was delivered at different levels via different means. So either it was orange juice or ascorbic acid, and either it was a half milligram, one milligram or two milligram dose. So there's a few things going on here. Part A says, for which dosage level of ascorbic acid did tooth length vary the most? And so you're looking for which one has the greatest variability? only the ascorbic acid group, which means you're focusing on the yellow box plots. Now, there's two things you could look at. So to describe greatest variability, either you're gonna be looking at range or IQR. So you could look at which has the longest box. And if you went with longest box, you might say the two milligram group, or you could go with, well, which has the largest distance between min and max. Now I've got boxed out there that middle yellow box plot because you do care about the outlier. So it's a common mistake just to look at the length from whisker to whisker, but if there are any outliers, you really need to include them too. So you do stretch even further than those whiskers for the second box plot. Regardless, the distance between top and bottom or min and max still looks to be the largest for the two milligram group. 
And so that's, that's what I point out there. So for that question, you only need to use one of those measures of spread, but, uh, but you at least you had two options. Part B, is the distribution of tooth length for pigs that received half a milligram of vitamin C in orange juice, left skewed, right skewed, or symmetric? So when you're looking at skewness, let me demonstrate a few of those here. You're looking at the second bullet there, and you could have no skewness like in the first and second plots. And so the first one is symmetric and bell-shaped. The second one is uniform because everything is the same or equally likely. The third figure is bimodal, and so that has two bumps. And the fourth and fifth figures are both skewed. Skewness is in the direction of the, the longer tail, or which way the longer tail is pointing. So for that first um, or fourth image, the second yellow figure, the longer tail is on the left side, so that's left skewed. For the last figure on the right, the longer tail is on the right side, so that would be right skewed. All right, so with that understanding, let's take a look here. B is asking to describe the skewness of the half milligram of vitamin C group with <clears throat> orange juice. So that means we're looking at the orange box plot at half a milligram, which is right here. And if you were to rotate that sideways so that the smaller values are on the left, you're increasing left to right. And I'm saying that because your tooth length your tooth length on the vertical axis, if you rotate that, you have to rotate that appropriately. I'm not sure if I'm doing this in the right image from your perspective, but, but essentially what you should see when you rotate that is something something like this. And so with that in mind, it looks like you have most of your data there, and then a longer tail on the right. And so this would be a right skewed distribution. And for C, at what dosage level are the median tooth lengths the same? Remember median is that thick line inside the box. And so you're looking for which boxes have pretty much the thick line at the same place. And that looks like at the two milligram dosage level. If you look at these two box box, box box plots, it looks like those two have the same horizontal location for that thick blue, thick black line. And that's where I report there. So the two milligram, because the thick lines look like they are equal in value. There is a part D, I just didn't give enough space there. So I've got that in another location, but it says describe the distribution for tooth lengths of the one milligram ascorbic acid group. If you happen to have read my summary up top in advance, you know what describing requires. It involves telling me a measure of center, a measure of spread, shape, and are there any outliers? So those four bullets there. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. So again, this is describing the distribution of tooth lengths for one milligram ascorbic acid group. So that is the box plot that I have in a box. And let's see, if we are describing that, it looks like, so center. Well, the median looks like it is about 16. It's definitely above 15. Maybe you'd say 17, 16.5, but somewhere around there would be the median. Your spread, you could either give range or IQR. So if you give range, it looks like I'm estimating that bottom whisker at 14 and that top point or outlier at about 22. And so I would report a range of about eight. <laughs> you could do IQR. IQR might be about two, according to what I'm estimating there. And that's fine, you only need one of those. And then spread, or sorry, shape, it looks like it's going to be right skewed because if you rotate it and you stretch the tail to that outlier, you're gonna have a longer tail on the right side. And there is at least one outlier there. There might be two overlapping, we can't really tell, but 
at least one outlier. And so that's exactly what I described here is that the median is 16. I gave the range of eight, it's right skewed, and there's one large outlier at about the value of 22. <clears throat> so with that, you should be ready to go ahead and complete the rest of this handout. I will just go through and give you the answers so that you can see how to do them. So for this third one, you would want to figure out, well, you need to estimate the approximate the range and the mean, which means you have to have an idea of how many values are in each of these rectangles. And so I've estimated by eyeballing and you could see at the top of each of these boxes in red, I wrote about what I think the frequencies are and the sum of those frequencies is about 353. You might have slightly different values based on your eyes, but it should be close to that. And so with that, I compute a weighted average for the mean. And the weighted average comes from this formula here on the right side. You want to multiply each frequency or group sample size by the count, or in this case, the median of that bar is a good approximation of what the value is. And then you're going to divide by the total sample size of 353. So I demonstrate that right over here. And so X bar is going to be one times 50,000 is the midpoint of this first bar. The next rectangle looks like, which spans 60 to 80 has a median of 70 or a middle point, a midpoint of 70. So that's gonna be 39 observations times 70,000 plus 82 observations for the third rectangle times the midpoint of 90,000 and so on. Deleting just a little too much there. There we go. <clears throat> and that should give you about 114,872. So again, you might be a little different if your approximations are, are a tad off, but, but it should be pretty close to that. The one thing that I did skip over, I apologize, is how to approximate how wide each box is. And so you can see I have more details in my x-axis than, than you do on the, the original handout. But what I can tell is, for example, between each of the written or typed numbers, 100,000 and 150,000, that those span 50,000 units and two and a half boxes. So you've got one box going from 100 to here, and then from there to here, and then halfway to 150,000. So two and a half boxes within 50,000 units. And so you could see when I divide 50,000 by two and a half or five halves, I got 20,000. So I know each box is 20,000 units wide. That's how I determined that with 50,000 in the middle, there's 10,000 left, 10,000 to the right, and that gets me to 40 and 60 for that first box. And then I just continue 20,000 um, every step there on. It's important, important step, especially if you want to get the range like they ask for in A. For the second part, describe the salary distribution for male professors at this particular US college. So over here, you're approximating the mean, which we did in part A. That's just under 115,000. You also got the range, which is measure of spread in part A of 200,000. It looks like it's slightly right skewed, a little longer tail there. And there doesn't appear to be any outliers or any observations that stand far apart from most of the data. So you could um, estimate Q1, Q3 to get the IQR and do the 1.5 IQR rule. But in this case, it, it doesn't seem like any outliers exist. 
And that's it. <clears throat> so with visual or graphical summaries, you've been exposed to a number of qualitative and quantitative graphs. You've practiced applying, um, being able to answer questions based on these graphs. And that's what, uh, what I hope that you are able to get out of this video. Enjoy.